in the past. But it highlights persecution in the present. Going into areas such as India. Going into areas such as northwestern Africa. Going into areas of the Middle East. And going into areas of China where Christians are literally being hunted and persecuted. Now, I don't know about you, but the, the most persecution I have ever faced in my life is just somebody making fun of me. Or maybe cussing me out because I'm a Christian. Or mocking and scoffing my beliefs about the Bible. Now... I've never been thrown in jail. I've never been faced a trial that would cause me to be beheaded. I haven't experienced that, and the reality is, is neither have any of you, most likely. And here, this passage, Paul understood what persecution was, and he knew that it cannot separate us from God's love. In fact, what we see in the book of Acts is God uses persecution to advance the kingdom of the gospel. Yeah. Maybe that's what we need in America. Maybe, hey, some of you remember the days when every church in America, whether it was the Baptist church or the Church of God or the Pentecostal church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church or, or hey, even the Episcopal church, it was full of people. And now today, most churches in America, I think the average church is about 80 or 90 people. And I'm here to tell you, perhaps... What will send revival to America is the church going under persecution. I'm told in China and in India and places in Africa where the church is being hunted, that is the place where souls are lighting themselves on fire for the gospel. But persecution can't separate us from God's love. Check it out now, famine. Would you say famine with me? Famine. famine. Now we live in America where even the homeless people don't starve. I mean, even the homeless people could go on a diet program, if you know what I mean. Here, here it says, can famine? I literally, the, now I will say this, when I was cycling across America, I mean, if you could just imagine, we're riding 100 miles a day. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a motorcycle where we have gasoline and petroleum that we're putting in. I'm talking about that my own body is the engine pedaling one stroke after another. And I was literally eating four to 6,000 calories a day. Just to keep it in perspective, the average person eats 2,000 calories a day. I was literally eating four to 6,000 calories a day, and I was losing weight. I mean, it's quite a diet program. I mean, I was eating like four or five big, massive cheeseburgers, hopping on my bike, getting my snacks in my back pocket and eating them, hopping off my bike to take a break and drinking a big 32-ounce protein shake, then hopping back on my bike and getting these Cliff Little Gel Bars and eating them and chugging water with, with like Gatorade packs in them. I mean, I was eating like an absolute pig. I was literally famished. I remember one day, I was in Arizona. Actually, um... I was about to go into Arizona. We, we were getting into a place in our first, it was like the second or third day in California. And I was so hungry. I was, I was literally, I was shaking, man. I mean, I think my blood sugar dropped like till almost, I should have been in the hospital. I was so hungry. That's the only time I've ever been famished. But did you know there are people right now all over the world who are starving to death? right now. They have diseases that are going to kill them because they're eating like the same grain, same strain and grain of rice every single day for every single meal and they develop diseases because they don't have a proper diet. And so here this passage, it tells us, hey, can famine separate us from God's love? No. Actually, what famine does is it shows the world that God is loving. Because God will take a country like America that is very prosperous. And that our ways can feed the world. And we have ministries like Feed the Hungry. We have organizations that major in going to these hard places where it's very hard to get to. And we drop food off and to help aid those people. Yeah. And so this passage reminds us that famine itself can't separate us from God's love. But then check it out. It goes on. And it says, can, can nakedness... This idea, some scholars think that this could present the idea of some type of sexual sin. I will say that any type of sin separates us from God's love. I mean, excuse me, from God's presence. But even if we've failed sexually, even if we have committed the act of lust in our mind, or we have um, actually partaken in sex outside of marriage, 
are partaking in same-sex attraction and same-sex physical um, intimacy, whatever it might be, whatever type of sexual sin we've encountered, whether it's adultery or whatever. Here the Bible, I think, is reminding us that that in of itself cannot build a barrier between the very love of God. Yes, it separates us from God's presence, but not His love. And so listen, my brothers and sisters, my friends, tonight, if you have messed up sexually in the eyes of God, there is a second chance. There is hope for us. Because the Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And check it out now, it says peril. This gives the idea of disasters that we go through. Paul knew about this. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned and left for dead. He went through dangerous scenes. He was on the boat and it went through a massive, massive a storm and it left him shipwrecked and he went into an island. He experienced these perils. Then this idea of sword. Can these things separate us from God's love? Now, by the way, this idea of sword, I don't think it just means you pick up a sword and you hold it in your hand. I think it's implying here engaging in some type of military combat or some type of physical idea of, of fighting. Well, whether you've been in combat before or whether you've committed the act of murder, God loves you. God desires to forgive those who've killed others. Then, verse 36, he emphasized the Old Testament, and I like verse 37. We'll just read this one. It says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Check that out now. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, was sent by the Father to conquer sin on the cross. And through his efforts on the cross, it demonstrated his love for all of us but then he defeated sin once and for all. He defeated death by rising again the third day. And by, by simply putting our faith in what he did there, we can also be conquerors. In other words, it literally means victors. Victors. Maybe you've read the Hunger Games. Maybe you've seen the Hunger Games movies. Whatever the case is, we know that they brought these young people from all these different regions in that fantasy world, and there they, they, they killed each other. Well, they, they were brought together for a specific purpose, and the one who stood at the end was the victor. Well, I'm here to tell you something. Tonight, we are victors in Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Yes, they place him in that tomb, but listen, he's not like Muhammad. He's not like all these other prophets. He's not like Buddha. He's not like Confucius. He was placed in that tomb, and he rose again victoriously from the grave, and he ascended up on high, and he's coming back to establish his kingdom on earth. Amen. And that God loves us, and that God wants us to experience his love. I like verse 38, because Paul uses the word persuaded. In the Greek language, this literally means to be totally convinced of. So the idea is this, that Paul the Apostle is totally convinced that tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, or all the other things that are mentioned in verse 38 and verse 39 cannot separate us from the very love of God. Check it out now. Here's a one. It says, death and life. Whether we experience the heartache and pains of death, or we experience the joys of life from a newborn in a hospital room. We understand that none of those things can separate us from God's very love. But check this out. In, in verse 38, it goes on. It says, angels. So the idea is this. Is that angels in heaven, or demons in hell, or the fallen angels on this earth, or Satan himself. Because remember, at one time, Satan was an angelic being. He was a cherubim created to bring glory to God. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah 14 mentions that. He was overseeing the music and he was full of great beauty. And it is very possible that as he was very gifted with music, he began to think, wow, look how gifted I am. And as he began to perhaps look himself into the mirror of the crystal sea in heaven, he said, man, I'm a beautiful creature. And he was lifted up with pride and he led a revolt in heaven that took a whole host of angels with him and he tried to overthrow the throne of God. Didn't work out for him. He was cast out of heaven. And this passage reminds us that even the work that Satan did in the garden in Genesis 3, that even that type of deceit that he is still actively doing now, and by the way, just so you're aware, Satan is a whole lot wiser than you and me. You remember when Jesus encountered the temptation in the wilderness in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 4? 
How did he respond to the temptings of Satan? He quoted Scripture. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every single time Satan brought a temptation his way, he said, don't tempt the Lord God. And he quoted Scripture. And so in this particular text, we're reminded that angels can't separate us from God's love. But angels, or fallen angels, or demons, if you will, can lead us astray. Maybe you've heard of this guy named Joseph Smith from like the 1800s. He was a man who's the founder of the Latter-day Saints, or the, the Mormon church, or the so-called Mormon church. And he claims that he received a vision from this angel, and the angel gave him a word, and he began to translate the, the word of God into his language, and he said, can you imagine, for 1,800 years, he was claiming that nobody had the right revelation of God. So for 1,800 years, was the church, the supposed church in existence, blind and damned to hell? And it took 1,800 years after Christ for a man like Joseph Smith to come on the scene who was supposedly directed by an angel? Listen. I read a Greek word for that. That's hogwash. That's crazy talk. My friends, I want you to understand that angels who do not affirm that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Messiah are actually not angels. They're disguised as angels in light. Remember what Paul said in Corinthians? He said Satan comes as an angel of light. Here, listen. These angelic beings, if they are still on God's side, they will lead us to God. But if they're not, they'll try to pull us away. <clears throat> but they can't separate us from God's love. They might try. But then check it out now. It says principalities and powers. We'll lump these two together. Because it gives the idea here of a powerful leader. When Paul was writing this letter, to the best of our understanding, you had an emperor named Nero who was overseeing Rome. And Nero was a man in the ancient Roman world who declared himself to be Caesar God, Lord God of Rome. And prior to him, Caesar was the same way, and after him, Domitian was the same way. And all of these individuals, these rulers, they created laws that would kill Christians because they declared Jesus to be Lord and not the throne of Rome to be Lord. And there are times when the powers that be create laws that prohibit us from practicing our faith. But I'm here to tell you something. As much as Satan is overseeing those efforts, he cannot... Hide God's love from us. I've heard of Muslims overseas. Listen, you can take this or leave this. I don't know, but I, I tend to believe it. I have seen and heard testimonies of Muslims who didn't have any access to the written word of God. And God showed up to them in a dream and directed them to go to a place. And there was a missionary in that place. And they received the word of God, even though it was illegal to be in that country. And so the Bible reminds us here that even the principalities and powers and kings and rulers, they can't hold the love of God back from us. It says, nigh, nor things present nor things to come. In other words, the things in the past, the things in the present, and the things in the future, it, it, it can't even separate us from God's love. Now listen, I understand. We all have a past. Listen, if you try to dig in my past, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find some dirt. If you try to dig in Pastor Dustin's past or anybody else's past here tonight, you're going to find dirt. Because we're sinners. We're fallen. We mess up every day. But the past, the present and future actions that we're engaged in. Listen, it cannot rob us from God's love. Yeah. Now, I like this phrase. Verse 39, it says, height or depth. I think Paul, in this moment, he's covered every kind of concept of life, from the trials we undergo, to persecution, to even life itself and angelic beings and, and kings and rulers and, and the past, the present, the future. But now in this moment, the height of death, I believe he's looking up to mountains such as Mount Everest and looking up into the skies and looking down into the greatest valleys, looking down in beneath the earth's crust into the portals of darkness. And he's saying whether you look up high in the sky or down low into the center of the earth, you cannot be separated from God's love in those places. The constellations can't do it. And then check this out. If there's any other creature, anything, similar word here that Mark uses in his gospel when he says, go into all the world 
and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that doesn't mean we need to go preach the gospel to all the squirrels and rats and moles and groundhogs. <laughs> That's not what it means. Uh, maybe you saw that, that music video about how the squirrel got into the church. And it was running up and down the aisles and got underneath Sister Betty's leg and crawled up her dress. And man, she, she started screaming and got, got saved that morning, that's for sure. <laughs> well, the Bible's not saying that we need to go and preach the gospel to the groundhogs and the squirrels, even though, man, they're rowdy sometimes. The Bible gives the idea, creature, it can be any human being, any person, any Jew or Gentile. And then I think Paul is also meaning any kind of being or anything in the world, anything, nothing can separate us from God's love. And Paul's convinced. He says, I am fully convinced. I am fully persuaded. I have heard the argumentation. I've heard the argument, and I've been totally convinced that what has been taught is fully true. Therefore, I believe it. That's what Paul's meaning here about I am persuaded. And remember, in verse 35, he says, Who or what shall separate us from God's love? And now, in verse 39, he's ending it, saying none of these things, none of these people, none of this shall be able to separate us. In other words, none of these things mentioned can build a wall of partition between us and God to God forfeit His love to you and me. In fact, God's love breaks down barriers. God's love shatters walls. In fact, when I was in high school, I took masonry class. I don't know why I took it. I have no idea. But there I went, I was in Franklin County, Virginia. I mean, you know what we were known for in Franklin County? We are the moonshine capital of the world. <laughs> And there we are, a bunch of country people, and here I am in masonry class. I don't even know why I'm there. I had no idea what a trowel was. I had no idea what mortar was. I had no idea what that stuff was. And so here we are, learning how to build chimneys, learning how to build these walls. And this one time, we had to build a wall out of cinder blocks. And then we had to put mud on the wall. And then we had to take these flat-shaped rocks and put them onto the slime and mortar. And we would come back the next day to see how our wall looked. And I got back the next day, I was like, man, mine's going to look good. Oh, yeah. And I got back, and every one of those rocks had fallen off onto the ground. It didn't look good at all. But I say that to say this, that that wall that we built in masonry class would be a wall to separate one party from another. And Paul's just saying that there's no wall you can build that will separate you from God's love. Nothing. So be encouraged tonight, church, that we receive the love of God. Remember what John says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's love is amazing. First John says we love Him because He first loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Would you bow your hearts with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? God, we come before you right now in absolute awe and wonder of your amazing love and grace. We pray, God, right now in this moment that you will encourage us, you will edify us, you'll build us up to be reminded that there's nothing we could do, there's nothing we could say. There's nothing we can be engaged in that would build a wall of partition to separate us from your amazing love. So God, I pray right now, in this moment, if there's an individual, man, boy, or girl, or woman, who's never experienced your amazing grace and love, God, we pray that tonight they would cry out to you. And so we pray, God, in this hour, for those that might be lost, you'll draw them to yourself. For those that are believers who have been struggling in their walk with you, I pray you'll take this passage of Scripture, you'll use it to encourage your church tonight, and that you will have your will and your way in this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people say,
Amen. Talking about God's love. And I want to read one more scripture here. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son who receiveth. And I was thinking about this, this little talking about God's love. Sometimes we can go away from God, but yet God still loves us. That means when you go away, God's going to start bothering you. When you're not doing what God says, it doesn't feel good being bothered by God. You know why kids, kids get in trouble? Because the parents love them. Does that mean the parents don't love you just because they correct you? No, that means they love you. They want to help you. But it doesn't feel good when your parents are after you. It doesn't feel good when the person in authority says you, you're wrong, but they still love you. It doesn't feel good when they sometimes they'll say no, sometimes they ground you, sometimes they spank you, sometimes they do whatever. It feels bad. But you know why they do that? Because they love you. And sometimes we go through things in life. Sometimes we go through problems in our life. We go through tribulations in our life. And it helped me grow. Every time I went through problems in my life that I hated, I learned from it. I, only a few times in my life did I really fight the Lord a little bit. A few times. Some people have fought Him for years. And it's not a good thing when you're fighting the Lord. I, the, first, probably the first time I really ever fought the Lord was when the Lord called me to the ministry. I didn't want to preach. And I know I turned this to our congregation, but I'll say here. Lord called me to preach when I was 16 years old. And I said, okay, Lord, that sounds great. I'll do that later after high school. And I went and I, and I thought, I'll just ignore it. I'll accept it. But let me get through high school. Let me get through baseball season. That was my mindset. Let me do what I want to do. And I'll worry about God. I got my June sophomore year. I got my junior year and senior year. Leave me alone, Lord. And the more I sat in church, the more the Lord started bothering me. Why? Because he loved me. And I remember for probably about four weeks, I went to church miserable. Sat there just condemned. I didn't want to go to church for those four, four or five weeks. I sat there just absolutely misery. Because I knew what the Lord wanted me to do, but yet I was refusing to do it. I remember just like it was yesterday. I was sitting somewhere in the back of the pew. Bothered by the Lord, but yet He loved me. When I said no more, He still loved me. He said, come on, I, I called you, come on, do what you need to do, but I still love you. And I remember how scared I was of my family, scared of what my grandma would say, scared of what my dad would say, terrified of what the church would say. And I walked forward that day at the, in church and came forward and my Sunday school teacher, Taylor Sizemore, we're sitting there, I told Taylor, the Lord's called me to preach. And I, and, I, and I just, it was like a burden lifted my off. You know why? He still loved me even though I refused for those few weeks. God has something big for you. Don't run from God. It's horrible getting in trouble from the Lord. It's a horrible feeling. But you got to remember, God still loves you. No matter how far you've gone, God still loves you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what trials, tribulation, heartache, stress, sickness, God still loves you. And, and sometimes it's hard to fathom what he was talking about, talking about through tribulations, trials, sicknesses, God still loves you. And if your Lord's bothering you, if you need to get saved, God's giving you another opportunity to come forward. Another opportunity. And that's called God's love. Give you another opportunity to come and confess your sins to the Lord. Come, confess your sins to the Lord. He's sitting there with his arms wide open, ready to say, Hey, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Lord, me for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I probably butchered that verse. But you get what I'm saying. God loves you and he wants you to come. What are you going to do with God's love? Are you going to sit there and ignore God's love? and sit there and just say later, 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 later and sit there miserable sit there and act, sit there and just be miserable the rest of your life or you want to accept God's love just realize that God's love there is not good enough. you got to do something about God's love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life but I remember when I went back to my story a little bit when, the, when I went forward to preach you know what my pastor told me a few months later, he asked me to preach my first sermon. I, and I think about it, it's crazy. 16-year-old behind the pool. But I think David might have been there that first sermon. It was bad. I was doctrinally incorrect. I was all over the place preaching things that weren't even in the Bible. And it was bad. I don't know. But God still loved me even though I was preaching things that weren't exactly right. And I was scared to death, shaking. Started preaching in the nursing homes when I was 16-year-old going around. God loved me even though I messed up a lot. Let's stand as we get ready to sing. If there's a need in your life, don't hesitate. You want the peace of your life? The Bible says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That means you can lose your joy today. Whatever you're doing, accept God's love. Accept His life. Don't sit there and let the Lord bother you. It's a terrible place to be in. One,